let's start with introductions um, and launch into the meeting. Welcome everyone to the May 2023 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, I will go around my screen and if people could just give a brief introduction, that would be great. Um, Erin, can we start with you? Sure. Hi, everybody. Erin Jacobson from the Attorney General's Office and specifically our office's Community Justice Unit. Great. Chris. Uh, Christopher Loris, a research associate with Crime Research Group here observing. And uh, full disclosure, I am an appointee to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, but I am not here in that capacity. Great. Elise. Hello, my name is Elise, and I am here on behalf of Kids Safe Collaborative, which is based in Burlington and Chittenden County. Welcome. Thank you. Derek. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. Derek Miodevnik, he, him pronouns. Uh, my role is the Community and Restorative Justice Executive with the Department of Corrections, so I'm the designee for Commissioner Demo. Great. Thank you. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from um, the Office of the Defender General's uh, panel member. Great. Tiffany. Hi there. Hi, Hi. how's everyone? I'm Tiffany North Reed. I was actually, hi there. I was invited to attend by Susanna. Um, I will be working with her at the Office of Racial Equity um, as a data lead. And I'm very excited about the work that's being done here and excited to support the efforts going forward. So thank you for having me here. Absolutely. Thank you. Hi. Can I jump in? Sure. Yes. Jump in. I showed up exactly at this moment. I'm sorry that I'm late. I was next door at the State House trying to figure out some logistics. Um, the um, yes. Hi, welcome, Tiffany. Um, when you introduced yourself, everybody's eyes got really wide because they're saying to themselves, oh, finally, we got someone. So um, so yes, uh, everybody, hi, really happy to be here as Tiffany introduced herself to you. She is the lead for the DRJS that this panel is responsible for um, creating. Uh, her second day is today, so be gentle. And um, we have already begun having conversations about work plan, envisioning, and MOUs, and um, she's got a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm. It is both exhausting and exhilarating. Great. We are so happy that you're here. <laughs> On so many levels, Tiffany, thank you so much. Thank you. I, and I have a lot more. I'm on public Wi-Fi, so I'm a little nervous about having the video on. So hopefully it will be kind to me. Um, but I, everything is resounding with me. Everything that you're doing is is amazing. Um, and I've just been doing a lot of background now, um, reviewing some of your um, reports and minutes and getting um, up to date. But I, I feel like this is where I, th I think where you're going is 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 wonderful and um i see a good fit i'm excited Great. i'm ready to meet all of you and to um, be a part of this um, looking forward to that welcome okay um mark good evening everyone i am reverend mark hughes and I am the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. I'm a Burlingtonian. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome, welcome, Tiffany, for sure. Thank you, Susanna. And uh, um, I'm also the, um, the chair of the Health Equity Advisory Commission. So I'm definitely interested in hearing more about um, some of the stuff that's going to be happening since we got Tiffany on the ground. I don't want to like make you nervous, Tiffany, but we are glad to see you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tyler. 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director um, in the for the Department for Children and Families, Family Services Division. I am the commissioner designated appointee to this panel. Great. Jessica. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Brown. She, her pronouns. I'm an at-large appointee to RDAP, and I uh, teach and work at the Vermont Law and Graduate School. Great. Thank you. Susanna, do you want us, you want to tell the world who you? Yes. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Great. Jeff. Jeff Jones, a panel member at large. I'm not trying to be cool. This time of year, the sun comes over my thing into my eyes, and I can't see the screen unless I wear a hat. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> Sheila. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome, Tiffany. So happy to have you here. Sheila, she, her pronouns, um, panel member and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Uh, oh, there. Jennifer. Um, Jennifer Pullman, I'm the director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victims Services. And Your audio is a little funky, just so you know. Is this any better, or maybe I'll move, I'll, I'll move to a different room? Can okay. you say who you are again, Jennifer? I'm Jennifer Pullman. I'm the director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. Did that come through? Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Ding. Well, you don't want to be late. Hello, everyone. I'm Ting Ren. I'm the evaluation and programming analyst at Shelburne Farms. I'm a community member on the panel, director of racial equity. Um, and sorry, I missed the last two meetings uh, because I had a conflict and, uh, and, and I can only stay for 45 minutes today, uh, but I'm trying to keep up with the notes and also the two subgroups that I'm working with. Um, yeah, so, so glad to see everyone today and welcome Tiffany. I'm so excited about uh, your new role here as well. <laughs> oh, thank Witchy. Hi everyone, my name is Wichi Arthur, pronounce he, him, his, Executive Director of Vital Partnerships and Data Systems and Health Equity uh, Expert, appointed to this um, advisory group uh, by the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Grant? Uh, Grant Taylor here taking minutes for the meeting. Great, thank you. Judge Morrissey? I, hopefully you can see, is, is my video on? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'm Mary Morrissey, I'm a Vermont Superior Court judge and I am the judiciary designee to this committee. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And Matthew, Vermont Child Advocate. Great, you did it, thanks. Um, I'm Matthew Bernstein, he, him pronouns, uh, Vermont Child Youth and Family Advocate. Um, welcome, Tiffany. I'm a member of the community and I'm going to be cooking dinner and doing some child care during this meeting. So I will mostly listen, um, but I am here. Thanks so much. Great. Hey. Oh, and Julio, you, you've just popped up. I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general director of the civil rights unit. I'm here as a member of the public. Great. Thank you. Okay. For announcements, we had, well, um, Susanna had the, like, you know, the big announcement <laughs> that we have Tiffany now. Thank God. Um, I feel like this is the culmination of an enormous effort, which I guess I feel that way because it is. Um, but uh, again, thank you. And the only announcements that I have are that Jen Firpo cannot make it, Chief Don. Stevens will not be able to make it. And Tim Leader Dumont won't be able to make it. He's ill. Um, he was struggling and trying to come. And I just sort of said, would you please just go to bed? Um, so I think he did. 
Um, and those are the announcements I have. Anyone, any others? All right. I kind of have. Oh, go ahead. I kind of have one, and I think you actually, um, some of you may already be aware of it. There's a grant opportunity um, that was brought to my attention. They have a webinar on it today, and um, it's an inter uh, multidisciplinary type of thing. And I'm trying to find the, oh dear, the pressure. Um, Sorry, it's a data visualization of structural racism and place. Oh. And um, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Um, it calls for multisectoral and interdisciplinary approaches. And it's from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And um, if anybody wants to review this, and if you think that it may be something that we might be interested in or that our partners or that state government could get involved in, then I'd be happy to support an application however I can. Alt H, no, there is no chat. You're not getting anything in the chat. Um, Email it to me and I'll email it out. That's better it done. Okay, thank you. Uh, Witchy. <clears throat> yeah, just a quick announcement that um, the subcommittee that's doing the community safety reviews um, or um, reviewing them um, has met and we've delegated and we are hoping to have, um, at least for our own internal subcommittee, some ideas of what we're working with by the end of the month. Great. Thank you for that. That's good news. Okay. Anybody else? No. Okay. Then let us move on to the minutes from our meeting last month. Any discussion, any corrections, um, changes from anyone? No. Okay. Then we would need to entertain a motion. I move to approve the minutes from our April 11th meeting, I think. April I believe 11th. so, yes. Yeah. Is there a second. Got it. All in favor, please shout or wave your hand or something. Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstaining? Uh, me, I wasn't there. Got it. Thank you. The motion carries. The minutes are approved as submitted. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, now onward to the state of DCF requests of the RDAP. You will recall that we keep putting this off because things keep coming up. <laughs> Um, and that's why it is at the top of the agenda tonight, because, by God, we've got to look at this. You, the uh, spreadsheet that was initially created by Susanna, Jessica, and Sheila, yes, was, the, was sort of the seed for this. Elizabeth went on and went further with it. Everything is in SharePoint. We were to look at it and each of us talk about primary concerns so that we could sort of direct the DCF people, that would be Tyler too, um, toward where they will, where the RDAP would like them to go. So I would like to do that now. I'd like to go through people's um, reviews of the of those sheets that information and put that forth so that we have something to give to Tyler can we do that okay the silence is not making me feel very reassured but um if we cannot do that May I ask what we can do? Rebecca. Hi. I'll jump in and happy to start the discussion. 
Um, Great. Maybe people can respond, but um, Tyler, thanks for uh, being here. I'm going to direct to you because I, I, these are Elizabeth's um, recommendations that I understand she pulled from other groups' reports or conclusions, right? Sort of a summary to give us, uh, is that right? Clarification. These are these are recommendations, summary findings, things that these are all the activities in the realm of juvenile justice or um, you know DCF that we've kind of pulled together. These are these are the things that have been going on in the realm of ra racial equity work. So mm -hmm. there there are many and varied. Some of them are recommendations. Some of them are findings. They come from different reports, but we're touching all of it. So I'm kind of interested in feedback and a. Are there recommendations we should be like focusing more towards? Is there any concerns around any specific activities that we're starting to drive that we're identifying here? Are there any data points that are shared in that text that are of particular concern that we need to strategize around? Is Great. that helpful, Rebecca? I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if, I, if I'm going to take what you said and just maybe share what I took away as a high point. Um, and then jump into correct. But I saw that there was uh, some recommendations, findings related to concerns about reporting to getting law enforcement involved um, quickly, right? And there were various suggestions on how to deal with it, training um, or perhaps data collection. Um, that's also now merging with a second subject area, which is addressing directly how to, how to address racial disparities in the systems. There was references to CRG's recidivism report, which connected to our work, our great work last month related to the big 12 offenses. There's, there's a really hard hitting fact conclusion buried in there about the racial disparities of is it 16, 18 to 19 year old black youth uh, were excluded from this study that was, was being conducted by CRG's recidivism study because they were charged with the big 12. So there was this footnote in there and they say that 14% of the 18 and 19 year old uh, black youth were excluded. 14% of 18 to 19 year old black youth were excluded from the study because they were charged with the big 12 as compared to only 8% of white defendants who were similarly excluded because they were charged with the Big 12. So to me, what a big takeaway here that feeds into our concern last month was uh, a the significant damage that youth experience specifically when they're thrown too early into the criminal justice system, but the racial disparities, uh, which was discussed by Marshall last month about overall statewide arrests being somewhat like 300%, greater than uh, white youth. But here we have this figure in terms of the big 12 itself, right? 14% versus 8%. Um, so I think that's uh, an interesting theme I see uh, coming up here again, tracking data uh, in terms of, uh, I know there's suggestions here on how to get databases to capture uh, race and ethnicity data here in the court database system. And um, we know that there are other, other um, efforts in the judiciary trying to fix that. But I am interested to hear about DCF's um, particular uh, tracking of race data, particularly in terms of race and ethnicity data, not just of who's entering, not just the youth themselves, but who's making the calls to report who's taking the intake, um, who's making the charging decisions, like just sort of the, the whole picture of race and ethnicity. And I wondered if, if there's anything there. I think the final, I think that that's what I saw, but I also have another suggestion. If, if, should I just stop? But I have another suggestion that's not- No, on go, list. go. Uh, I've recently been made aware that Sarah George and Will um, Gradella, who's a, who's a prosecutor working in Sergio's office in Chippendale has initiated a project, I think not quite a year old, uh, and it's focused on CHINs, so not juvenile delinquencies, but CHINs, uh, child neglect petitions. 
And they were concerned about the significant racial disparities in that regard in Shinden County. And so they initiated a project again last summer where they they uh, included on their legal team third party screeners to be the first to receive the allegations, the affidavits, to scrub them, as I understand it, mm -hmm. of any identifying um, facts or information related to race or ethnicity. And once that was scrubbed, I understand then they brought it to the prosecutor to then make the, I think the hoped for uh, assessment of a more, of, of removing biases or trying to remove some of the biases that could come up into the affidavits. I thought that was fascinating and perhaps we might want to hear from her how it's going, um, mm -hmm. but that's the chins, but whether or not that could be a suggestion that we pursue uh, to address directly the discretionary biases that creep in at, at the prosecutorial stage for delinquencies. Okay, thank you. Tyler, are you, oh, go ahead, Aaron. I don't need to bring up um, new proposed priorities if Tyler wants to respond to what Rebecca just said. Okay. I mean, I think some of this, I'm I'm taking notes on all of the things that you're putting out there, Rebecca, is like, these are, these are potential areas of exploration. I think they're all good ones. Everything that went in here is stuff that we're, we're working on. Um, I, uh, I do, I do appreciate the fact that chins that might be, I don't know if that's considered outside of the scope of, um, this group, um, or within it. Um, it's, it's not the juvenile justice system we're talking about so much, um, but it's certainly an area of disparity and it's certainly an area of exploration. Um, and I also would be fascinated with the findings on what happens when they, you know, when, when they're looking at scrubbed, scrubbed cases. So I'm interested in that data mapping. There's several complications that come up with DCF. Um, one of the most significant complications we have is this, we have two systems that we utilize to hold all of our all of our data in. Um, the primary one is, I believe, from 1979, maybe 1982. Um, it is very, I think it's like a C++ sort of system. It is one of those that um, it is so aged that anytime we want to try to put in a new field or gather a new data point, um, there is risk that the entire system collapses. That's what we call the SSMIS system. Um, so we have been, that, that's been one of the things that DCF has put forth for the past couple of years. We've been able to put a little bit of uh, money into it every year. Legis the legislature has awarded us some money that will receive a federal match towards the development of what we call the CWIS system, which is um, a comprehensive child welfare informational system, which has greater capacity to communicate with other systems, so on and so forth. That's a multi-year project to build such a system, but I think that'll integrate nicely with the work that Tiffany's doing. Um, it should be able to speak to other systems. It is the standard that all states are reaching. Vermont is, I think, the farthest behind when it comes to child welfare systems in terms of tracking data. Um, every other state has at least what's called the SACWIS system, which is kind of the precursor to CWIS. And what we have is the precursor to SACWIS. So there's a big limitation in terms of how we can hold demographic data. Um, that being said, in the juvenile justice realm, a lot of what we rely on is data that comes directly from the courts. And so these report findings are coming from um, uh, court data around it. And often the court data is reflecting data sets that are incomplete. If, uh, if we, you know, and I think we've talked about this quite a bit in this group in years past about how if a law enforcement officer does not identify the race of a youth um, at, you know, at the starting point, that that kind of proceeds quite a ways down the line as just a NA, which is uh, problematic for us. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of questions about it, but we we've been really pushing forward. We want to un data is only valuable if it's um, if it's under uh, if it's consistent um, or these data is valuable with if it's consistent. So we can try to make assumptions about some of those unknown data sets, but we um, we can't conclusively say that everybody that's marked as an unknown is a is a youth of color. 
um, for example, but we can probably make some assumptions about that. So these are the data questions that have driven this group a lot. Um, and I think that's very interesting, um, or that's very worthwhile conversation, although I don't wanna bog down this group too much. Um, and lastly, the Big 12 conversation is, um, I think we'll talk about it more when we talk about S4 and how that's going. Um, I do, I think it's very interesting, uh, and it, that is a very relevant and very important data point of which youths are going kind of direct access to the adult criminal justice system when they are by age eligible to be going into the family system. So uh, that, you know, that's a very timely, relevant conversation. So these are all good starting points. Great. Thank you. Erin? Um, something that's of interest to me and is kind of squarely within the work that Willa and I do at the Attorney General's office um, is regarding diversion and pretrial services. Um, and I know there was a, a CRG report about um, disparate access um, to diversion and pretrial services, or I, I guess I would say um, folks of color being referred to diversion or pretrial services less often um, than white participants in that system. Um, and so um, the, uh, the diversion program has done a lot of work on its data collection. And so we could probably pull some of that um, and provide some of that information to RDAP and or the legislature. I would say that um, that's not, you know, having the data is important, but the other part of this is really with the decision making that goes into who gets referred and who doesn't um, by prosecutors. So that's another piece of the puzzle to take a look at and then connecting that to youth and the alternative justice programming that is available to youth, but um, making sure that we're tracking who has access to those alternative programs, who doesn't, um, and connecting that to the, it looks like there was a, the Vermont's Juvenile Justice State Advisor, Advisory Group um, funded the Burlington Community Justice Center to do statewide training on the benefits of pre-charge restorative justice programming for youth. Um, and so that is a that's a really potentially exciting place to be making a difference in that not everywhere around the state of Vermont has robust pre-charge programming. Pre-charge being when law enforcement just refers directly to a restorative justice, community justice center and the participant has the opportunity to just stay out of the criminal justice system entirely. Not every jurisdiction has that, so it's it's new. Um, and there are a lot, a lot of exciting conversations around trying to codify pre-charge, making that a more um, robust and streamlined and consistent opportunity. But because it's new, then we get to kind of design it from the ground up. And of course, that would involve um, data. So it's a, it's a great opportunity both for trying to help address um, issues that kids are experiencing that might um, lead them to being in, involved with the criminal justice system, but also in thinking how we design those alternative justice programs from the get-go. Okay. Tyler, do you want to respond at all to that or? Uh, I don't think I have a response so much as to say on that note about the um, pre-charge training. Um, uh, that is underway. That activity is underway. I know the state advisory group has not yet had an opportunity to, as a whole group, meet together and go over um, any preliminary findings associated with that work effort. Um, but as they do, um, I will ask that group if that's something I can share um, back to here, maybe bring representation um, to share it. Elizabeth actually would be phenomenal to present it when she's back. This should be the last month that you're stuck with just Tyler without an Elizabeth because um, she is due to come back at the end of this month, God willing. Um, and, uh, and so that would be, I think that'd be fantastic. 
Sheila, you had your hand up before. Do you did you did you want to take it down? <laughs> I, I wanted to sort of make a comment, but I didn't. And then I changed, I sort of changed my mind. So I did take my hand down. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Anyone else? Tyler, for the um, in spite of the fact that it sounds absolutely pathetic, I would look at Rebecca and go, what she said, that's where I went. And one of the reasons I went there was also partly because of the article that Willa Farrell sent to us that I sent out to the panel, um, which was that study from Northwestern, I believe it was Northwestern, um, having to do with how black and brown youths who were charged as adults were I don't remember how many times more likely within 16 years to die of a gunshot. It was fascinating, but it also, it was profound in the sense that it, um, it shows the resonances of such decisions that these high impact, high discretion moments that we've already identified have even further impacts that I don't, I at least personally did not suspect. And so that was part of what gave a lot of energy to what my choices were, even though they really mimic what Rebecca was doing, but it was partly, um, I really, that gave, that supercharged my concern around those areas. Anyone else? Rebecca. Uh, um, I'm not going to join on my own bandwagon with, with your comments, Aton, but actually I'm getting a separate request uh, because I referenced a CRG recidivism study that was referenced in Elizabeth's additions to our, and I know Chris, you're here not in the capacity of CRG, but is there a way for you, because we, we're trying to hide, to link those into the docs. I don't see that CRG recidivism. I'm yeah, um, right, right now I'm in the process of sending those to Grant. I don't see okay, it. I guess there's no chat on Zoom. I'm not a Zoom guy mostly. So. Correct. Well, there's not on this particular right. version. Eitan, who would you prefer me to send it to? You want me to shoot it to Grant right now? Or is there somebody else you want me to shoot it to? This is the report Both from them. CRG. Yeah, the two of them. The recidivism analysis. Nice it would be nice if you sent it to Grant and if you sent it to me and if you sent it to Mark Hughes. Perfect. I'll do that right now. Thank you. I don't have the capacity to send it to everyone at RDAP or I, I would. No, that's if you send it there, I'll, I can take it from there when we have, a, when I have a moment, it's perfect. Roger. hard to facilitate the meeting and email at the same time. So, um, but I will get there. I will do that. And um, Eitan, if you, forward those to me, I can put them in our SharePoint. So at least members can easily access these reports. Will do, will do, yes, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else? Tyler you does, oh, go ahead, Rebecca. Well, I, I, I did want to just, just flesh out a little more why I think this is the natural next move. Uh, there's, there's, we've done data to death, I feel like, on this panel. And, yes. and we know it's not finished. And Tiffany, I'm also going to say welcome. We're so excited you're here. Uh, but I think that also what we've identified is the discretionary decision-making points. And I think that I would love to see this panel now go to the next point, which is how can we try to check, make recommendations to the legislature on addressing directly the, the how discretion is exercised. And so I think that whether it's we invite Sarah Georgian to talk about this one particular project or go elsewhere and see what's going on nationally uh, in terms of, of directly addressing um, these, these critical decision-making points, um, 
but but I I would really love to see this panel go to this I think natural and critical next level. Okay, Tyler, I just want to say I really I really support um, all of your instinct on that. That's something that's really not just interesting to me, but um, as we think of the dis these discretionary points, I think there could be some value into just mapping where discretionary decision-making points are and understanding it. I had this awareness. Somebody was asking me a question about a certain data point. It had to do with youth of color entering into adult criminal charges or something like that from a report we had. And I kind of had this thought to me as, where, as I pinned it out. I said, this doesn't concretely say where the discretionary point is. My guess is that there are a multitude of discretionary points and every time they compound against each other so that when you're starting to measure at the highest level of impact of this is a youth who's entering into the adult criminal justice system, there's a number of decisions that have been made starting from this is a youth who had more policing activity in their neighborhood um, that turned into this is a decision of a uh, of a law enforcement officer to kind of to not divert um, to this is a decision made on how to charge this youth and it kind of goes up and up and up this is the you know this is denial of um, seeking a youthful offender opportunity or whatever it is so the higher that impact is the more compounded the the potential is and it would be really good to see is it is it an even increase is it just one point that is there's huge disparity is it you know where where does that lie and then that could really bring focus to what work needs to happen um, from an intervention standpoint uh to to kind of minimize that entire curve right susanna Thanks. I'm going to add to what Tyler just said. I think that once you start getting at those questions, um, at what point did some of the bigger impact happen and where are the discretionary points that have moved the needle more in a person's life than others, that's where you're really going to start to see the different systems at play, right? Because some of these decisions have to do with things like, hey, my public housing complex has a clean halls program, um, you know, and then before you know it, six months later, a guy girl is getting shot, right? Um, so I think that that's when you're going to start to see those non-criminal justice systems. And I know that, um, I know that this group is pretty squarely focused on criminal and juvenile justice, but, um, I think if we really want to start looking at those and talking about discretion, we have to be willing to explore other topics like housing insecurity, like food insecurity, like educational attainment disparity, uh, uh discipline in schools. IEPs and students living with disabilities, et cetera, because I think those are some of the decision points that are feeding into the decision points that we're talking about exploring. Mm -hmm. Okay. A anyone else here? Rebecca. I just wanted to bring in, because um, I've been on this panel for so long that I realize not everyone has has been, but Tyler, you asked this question of, of charting out the various uh, discretionary decision points in the delinquency system, right, and the criminal court system, and there was, and Jess, I'm really hoping you'll remember, uh, and others here on this panel, we mapped out those out, and whether it was ultimately at the beginning, and then we included it and built upon it the data entity project. But there is something with this panel's work where you know we have, we tried to address those. Um, so I just wanted to make that uh, share that with everyone. We did do that because I, I remember we were at the law school and Jessica wrote it on the blackboard. You remember that too, Susanna. Okay. Um, I'm I I wanna know where that went. That was a long time ago. I, I mean even, I know. I can even was that pre-pandemic if we were meeting yes. in person at it the was law was pre-pandemic. It was around August or September of 2019, because I remember I had just started, so it was my first art at meeting I or something. 
I don't throw anything away. I don't, I, don't, I will look through um, and see what I can find. But but there is that. But I appreciate Susanna's point and uh, critical point, which is yeah. I know what we did not do. Um, we, I think we started it from point of initial contact with this system, yes. which we identified. And Sheila, you were great to point that out. It was school systems, right? We were thinking beyond just law enforcement as initial contact, but who was reporting the kids to law enforcement? I remember that because Sheila, you went on, you were talking about uh, guidance counselors and such. Yeah. And I think the reason why I haven't said anything is because I think I said my things at our last meeting, if I'm not mistaken. And one of those things I thought that I brought up was mandated reporting. And right. specifically, we often just think of the school system, but the school system in itself is just enough to think about and how that's mandated. And what's like going off of what Susanna said, I mean, we're talking about when we talk about those identities of those youth, those are also typically uh, disproportionately the youth are who are entering or getting reported on in terms of um, going into DCF as well. And so I'm not only curious about within the schools, but the whole conglomerate of people who are mandated porters from people who are running organizations that are housing youth to the counselors to, to whomever. There are so many people. And what does that mean? And from what I've heard and understand, there's um, an overreporting, and that disproportionately affects youth of color. And then once the youth of color enter the system, I mean, we're, that's all the conversations that we're having. So I'm, I'm very much um, think that's a priority for us um, to be talking about that. I also just wanted to bring up <clears throat> Because, Rebecca, I don't want to, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out what space it would be that wouldn't be this space to say this, because I want to make sure I'm understanding what you're talking about with the chins bias and scrubbing cases. I felt the reason why I raised, well, the reason why I raised my hand is because I felt something, a reaction when um, the scrubbing of cases, um, using that language and the actual act of scrubbing of cases, because it was like a yes and, and I wanted to make sure in this space that I said the and of that. So as I understand and see the relevancy of having scrubbed cases, I kind of wonder how far that goes, because I'm not really trying to create equalness or being equal and trying to create equity. And I'm trying to create visibility. I'm trying to dismantle white supremacy culture. And so in those things, you actually see me and you actually see my race and I'm actually represented. And in an equitable way, I'm actually then um, given the resources I need and not in an equal way. And I just think, I don't want to speak for, but uh, I know Chief Don Stevens isn't here. If we think about the indigenous people, the native people, I think this really, really <laughs> pertains to they have some separate rights as well. And so we can't deny their culture, or their race um, um, when they're entering, even though maybe others would. And so I just wanted to be careful that I'm sort of curious of if that was something that the RDAP choose to adapt or want to go further with, then my hope is it would be like, not like a game, but like a tester of like, okay, we presented it as you scrub, but actually guess what? These people are this. And then we proceed accordingly based on who they are, but don't continue on a scrubs thing throughout the duration of whatever needs to happen. And I just, I don't know if that's clear on here for people who might be tuning in on video. I don't know what their reactions, but I had a somatic feeling to being scrubbed and being invisibilized, even though we know that's what's currently happening, for us as the RDAP to actively suggest or participate in it is something different for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rebecca. Yeah, no, I appreciate you um, sharing that here, Sheila. And uh, I, think, I think that what I was referencing that I understood the project that Sarah George is implementing in her office is the internal office decision as to whether to charge a particular youth with an offense. And I and and also or no, not not it's in the chins context. Sorry, she's doing it in the chins, whether to file a chins petition against um, parents, right? To get that family pulled into the child welfare family court system. What's intriguing to me is she's she's doing that in the context of address disparities, 
And I too have concerns or que questions as to how she's doing it, what she's, what she's, what, what they're focused on removing uh, from a defender's perspective. I see police affidavits with loaded racial, racialized language where, uh, where uh, you, you know, you wonder how much uh, police officer suspicion is being going towards criminality versus completely innocent conduct. Uh, based on the race and ethnicity identified by the affiant, the law enforcement officer, you can see it throughout. In terms of, are you are you are you hanging out in front of a store window suspiciously? What is this? Everything, all this innocent activity is, is all of a sudden criminalized, right? And and so to me, it's an intriguing idea that some pro some prosecutors' offices around the country are trying to do some self-reflection internally to address those disparities. I've seen some prosecutor's offices like Sarah George do it by bringing in sort of removing, trying to remove that subjective bias that they're worried about in the charge if they don't, that the prosecutors don't see it from, because they're reading it in the affidavits, what's going on and how, if that approach is working, what is it based on? So for me, it's, I shouldn't have suggested a whole, uh, you know, I, I want I want us to make that recommendation. To me, it was interesting to know we have a prosecutor here in the state doing something similar, how she got there to learn from her, uh, whether she has any results since she's almost a year out uh, from implementing this project, whether it's useful, what she's learned. So that I, I thank you for letting me clarify that, but I think it's an interesting idea. Uh, lots of potential problems with it, for sure. Thank you. Thanks for your response, Rebecca. Anyone else? Uh, Judge Morrissey. Hi, thank you. Um, so, can I just ask when you were when you did the the um, exercise in 2019 about trying to identify the decision points? What did you then do with that information after you did that? Did it go further than that, where somebody actually took it to the next step to see what was happening at those decision points, or did you just identify the decision points? Because I think that's a really interesting exercise to do, and I think it may be worthwhile to do it again, because I do think that having floated through you know, now three counties um, during the pandemic, I think that the pandemic did result in, in more counties using um, alternative ways, al alternatives to the criminal justice system, and it may be worth doing it again. So I'm just curious as to what happened after you did that. We... It, it and it in it in the end it morphed into one of the two reports that came in I can't remember if it was 20 20 or 2021 where we um identified the high impact high discretion moments and put those out for the legislature to consider we did not we found that there was tremendous uh, variability in what actually got looked at. I mean, some of the areas that we identified, there was no data or some important organ in the criminal justice system didn't have the data, others did. It was very uneven. If I'm wrong on that, would someone correct me? But that's my memory. But that's what it morphed into in the end. Mm -hmm. And do you know whether or not after the report was generated, that resulted in people looking at those decision points or did it just get introduced and then it just kind of stopped? Um, if I weren't so doe-eyed and optimistic, I think I'd say it just stopped. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure, I don't say that happily. <laughs> No, under understood. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? If, if possible, um, I just I've been taking um, all the information in, um, but I would be interested in seeing that um, kind of that conceptual mapping of those decision points because I, I think it. Of course. It it could it could lend to finding data to support um, 
maybe understanding that better and figuring out kind of where to target efforts. Um, I, I really think that, um, you know, you could have the potential for a kind of analyses um, where we could look at um, it. Depending upon the data, um, we might do a multivariate analysis and see which one of those decision points has a, a stronger impact. And generally, we would say, okay, we would look at what they might call a coefficient of variation. Um, and we could really map all of those different decision points and see which one comes out to be, um, to have, you know, the most influence or could even, um, you know, somehow rank them depending upon that. Now, it gets a little bit complicated, I think, and maybe this is where um, we kind of get together with the different departments and see what data is available, because I know that um, depending upon the question that we're asking, the level that we're looking at, because, um, you know, there could be potential to link it, to do, to link by individual, but I doubt that that um, capability exists across departments. Um, yeah. but, but, but we could, it could be an ecologic study to start where we can look by county. Maybe we're not linking individually. So it could give us a rough idea of, you know, where these different decision points, um, you know, how they're operating by county level. Um, but I just, but it, but, but it's very fascinating. I think this discussion and it, it's given me a sense of where the needs are. So I, hopefully that, that helps a little bit. We'll have to get those reports to you, Tiffany. So I'll, I'll, I'll have to get your email address and um, so I can forward those to you. I'll do that. Thank you. Mark. I'm just going to keep my video off because I'm just, things are pretty goofy over here right now. But I, I would just add to that, um, to the whole conversation, that it, it's important that what we're focusing on is, is high impact, high discretion decision points. Because there are, there are a lot of decision points, and this goes back to the conversation that we were having about five years ago. We're having the same conversation, mm -hmm. but those, I think with data, and I probably would get an agreement from most everyone on this is, is that we don't want all the data. We want the most, we want the data that's most significant, right? We want the data that's, that's going to be, that's going to, you know, serve the highest utility and make us most impactful. Um, so just a caution on decision points. Uh, high impact, high discretion is what I would be looking for. Okay. Thank you. Witchy. Uh, going off of Mark's point, I do agree that we don't want all the data and that we should be selective. I guess my question is like, who gets to say where those impacts are and how, or like those, those like selected areas and how were they decided? Um, I guess that would be my follow-up question in support of Mark's point. Rebecca. So um, quick responses and, and a suggestion. Uh, the next month we put on the agenda, try to dig up that history of discretionary decision-making points to just share. And whether we want to spend five minutes or, or longer on it, we can have all be on the same page and then go from there. But uh, which I think I'll share this much of my recollection of the 2019-18 period where, where I can see us in that classroom in VLS. Um, I, my recollection, we were trying to land on with our expansive mandate where we should prioritize our efforts for recommendation. Right. And so we wanted to first understand, we knew as, as Mark said, we need could we didn't want all data, we need to address high impact discretionary decision-making process. That's where we could have the greatest impact if we address those, right? And so, but to get there, we had to identify everything. And which as you asked, how did how do we go about identifying the high impact? We literally, if I recall, sat there and 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 grouped them in terms of, of 
general places, pre-charge, charge to conviction, conviction to sentencing, sentencing, imprisonment, or where, you know, and then post-sentencing, and that was just criminal, and that's missing 10 of them, right? And then I think we got to a point, and others can, can correct me, my recollection is we were like, well, among the high impact decision making points within those major parts within the criminal court system, the criminal legal system, juvenile legal system, we thought it all compounded, right? As, as Sheila was saying, going even before the arrest. And so we focused on the beginning and we spent a lot of time at the law enforcement initial contact with law enforcement, not before law enforcement, not the mandatory reports. I think also the discretionary decision-making points came back in when we were at the subcommittee level, at the data entity planning level, where we were trying to figure out, uh, Tiffany, we identified all the places where we should collect, ideally, we did a idealist recommendation of race and ethnicity data, and we wanted who was making the discretionary decision-making points at the high impact ones. And so we identified that in one of our appendices to the report. So, recommendation, maybe next month we can pull all these little pieces together and on the same page. Sure. I also remember after we did that, we we gathered, we we sat there and we we had so many moments, as Mark is alluding to, that we had just ridiculous number of moments of discretion. And then we picked the top five, if I'm not mistaken pick the top five and we relied on which this is getting to your question we were we were relying on everyone who's on the panel who has experience with this um at which those top five what those top five moments would be how impactful how important again though this re this sort of calls forth Sheila's concern, which has been uh, constant here, about it doesn't just start with law enforcement. I mean that it goes to the schools. Um, and that did not get fleshed out as well as it ought to have been. Sheila, what is that emoji? I think it's a crying face if it's not my bad. <laughs> it was a cry. I wasn't sure why it was doing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Why? Because, you know, we, we've, it's only been like actually seven years. It's been five plus years of just bringing up, you know. Right. I right. appreciate that we're talking about it now. <laughs> I also want to add a double crying emoji because of all the things that we did in, in the processes to get there, we have we've only even just begun at the beginning part of the discretionary decision-making with the law enforcement contact. And as, as now is coming out tonight, we're, we, didn't, we weren't even complete in that effort. Forget, we haven't even gotten to the part of charging, you know, pre-trial, right? Or diversion, you know, Aaron, what you talked about. So yeah, talking about the triple emoji crying. So At least. So I'm not privy to everything that you all have talked about in the last um, however many years you've been doing this committee, um, but Sheila's point just made me think of something in a very unofficial capacity. My organization produced the current mandated reporter training. Um, my understanding is that DCF is going to potentially be creating a new one, and there might be opportunity with the new training being developed um and somebody at dcf probably knows way more about this but to utilize some of the data that you're talking about to impact um the way in which the training is developed before it is um so that's a word on the street that a new mandated reporter training is coming um in the state of vermont and i'm not sure if you all knew about that or not are you saying this is new curriculum or somebody new who's going to lead it or both um, I have no idea about the curriculum because I don't believe Kids Safe Collaborative is going to be a part of it this time around. If you watch the training now, that's um, that was directly produced at Kids Safe, and I don't believe we are going to be doing it this time around. I think it's going to be mainly out of the DCF offices, and I'm not sure how far along that is. Um, I'm just saying it's something that should maybe be kept on the radar um, and looked out for. 
um, but we wouldn't be a part of it this time around. So it'd be a new group um, producing it. Oh, can I just respond to that? I think that's really huge. And I don't know if that's in Tyler's wheelhouse or somebody else's wheelhouse of understanding, you know, what are, I know that we've had many presentations around the DOC and other things at the Academy or whatever of what they do. I would love to know that about DCF. What are a little bit more about, not a little bit more, a lot more about the trainings, about all the things, all the things, just like they came in and told us all the things about the adult stuff. Like, I want to hear a more presentation about what is all the things, what is the training, what are the hours, what is the curriculum, how do you choose? All that stuff is really interesting to me. So thank you for sharing that. And I apologize if I like said something I wasn't supposed to. I just know that it's on the radar to be redone. I can respond to that, but Erin, you've had your hand up. I'll go go ahead, time. Tyler. Yeah, Please respond I, while we're on this topic. Of course, Sheila, it is a little bit, uh, it is it is outside of my wheelhouse when we're talking about mandated reporters. All the things, some of that is in my wheelhouse. DCF is obviously responsible for a lot. And so um, uh, when you're talking about trainings, are you talking about the trainings that uh, that we provide for, for family social workers, our foundations trainings, how we're onboarded, that sort of thing? Or are you talking about training specifically for mandated reporters, which Elise, I, I will commit to getting some more information about what that is and what's going into that. I don't have anything to say right now about it, but I can bring something back next month um, about what the intention is, uh, how to make that a, a better training, a more purposeful training. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think all the things DCF is, is many varied. There's, there's a hundred different policies that, that we can kind of go through. I am the older youth, um, which in part is juvenile justice, um, which is why I'm a representative here, but, um, I, it goes far beyond that to your points earlier when, uh, families become child welfare involved to Rebecca's point about this is a, a chins case. Um, this is the family who becomes involved with DCF is what type of correlation do we see between children who go through the foster care system and other outcomes, their involvement in juvenile justice, criminal justice, so on and so forth. So I think I think we can ask lots of those meaningful questions. But um, uh, in terms of bringing the what goes into the work of DCF, that is a many varied answer that would probably be best done probably by multiple people. Aaron. Um, thanks. Just to add another layer to the conversation around um, discretion points and high discretion points in particular, um, I think it will be so fantastic to have this information shared um, next month and it will be illuminating. And then we will also have to think about when we identify those decision-making points that we might want to try to do something about, for example, put some parameters around, how, how can we do that? Um, who has the authority to make the decision? And therefore, who has the authority to perhaps limit the discretion or add um, instruction about the discretion? Um, it's kind of a legal question, but it's we can't assume that the best approach would be the legislature because the legislature might not have constitutional authority to tell prosecutors what to do. Um, so I just think that's another layer we will have to think about it at, once we identify those decision-making points, um, what are our recommendations for how to provide some parameters that we think will make a positive difference. Okay. Sheila. Um, Tyler asked um, what what points or, or what would it be? Um, I guess my response to your question is, I, I don't know what I don't know. So I can't fully answer that question without saying yes and. So the yes is I want everything because I don't know what I don't know. So I don't know what to ask. And the focus of the conversation we're having right now is those high discretion points. That can be the start 
of the focus. So if we think mandated reporting is a high discretion entry point, then I would want to know what type of trainings, what type of policies, what type of things, what type of change avenues do we have to change mandated reporting? And any of the other high discretion points that we identify in the juvenile system, whether they're connected to you or not, maybe they're not connected to you, but maybe you're connected to the people it should be connected to that you could say, hey, this isn't my wheelhouse, but this is so-and-so wheelhouse house. And if they're not on the call already, maybe we can get them on the call. But um, that, I guess, to focus it, it's like I want everything, but to focus it for this group in this conversation, high discretion points. Thank you, Sheila. I just wanted to, I guess, um, there's, Vermont is unique in that juvenile justice is is managed in the same agency that um, uh, the child welfare is managed. And so when we're talking about mandated reporting, um, we're talking about cases that are opened up uh, for the purposes of child welfare, um, which I, I, it, it's, I, I, it is a discretion point, but is it the same discretion? How is that related as a discretion point to a discretion point around somebody getting involved in juvenile justice? It is, um, it would be, Potentially, there's a link there or a correlation there, but it's quite removed those two things because they're they're very separate actions. Um, one is introducing into you know into the justice system for an, an act, a, a, a delinquency, and the other one is a question about um, does this youth remain in this home with this family? Um, and I and I don't know that I could speak to. So I that's that's kind of what I'm. That's why I'm a, mandated reporting is a discretionary point um, that has mitigating variable on the other end because all mandated reports are then addressed by DCF in a uniform way and the majority of them are screened out um, because this doesn't rise to the occasion where there's concern of safety in this environment due to X, Y, and Z factors. And so, so, um, I guess that's the context for that. That being said, who decides to call in on a mandated report or as an unmandated reporter? Uh, absolutely, there's discretionary. There's discretion behind that, but that's data that can't be tracked necessarily because those reports can come from from anyone for any reason. Some of which might be just overt in their bias, which would lead to a screen out. Are you making the claim between people who are actual registered mandated reporters versus somebody who's just making a mandated report? Is that the differentiation you're referring to in this moment right now? In this moment, I'm just saying a report can come through um, by anybody. If there is concern of abuse or neglect occurring, any person can call up the hotline and make a report. Here's my concern and why. Mandated reporters are there certain people that should they not report, should they see something that is of concern, um, that 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 they are liable, they have to report that because they're mandated. So this is educators, doctors, lots, you know, lots of different people. So that that's a report is not necessarily by a mandated reporter. A report can be from anyone. Okay. So yes, yes. Okay. So I understand that. And I think that that's part of like the narrative of what we're talking about. I think being yeah. able for myself and maybe this group to understand the complexity and the spectrum of yeah. mandated reporting is part of, I think, educating us or informing it, forming us of this so we can figure out what to do. But I think what I'm asking is any and all of that, that leads back to DCF, <laughs> any and all of that that leads back to, to the juvenile justice system. It's a yes. And it's, it's all whether I mean, you just said that it all ended up funneling through the DCF and all these other things. And so if that is the case, that is what I'm asking for. I'm not saying the group, we have a common consensus of the group we're asked for. So um, I'm saying I would like to see um, more of what that means, whether it's somebody and maybe even those numbers, because even whether you're a mandated reporter legally, quote unquote, or not, it's about the final outcome. And we're talking about disproportionately youth of color entering into the system and then what happens to them therefore on. So yes, how they got into the system, yes, but we're also talking about that outcome. So that's a discretion point, but it doesn't eliminate the outcome that we're talking about. So it doesn't matter whether it was Sarah or whether it was Joe who made the report, both of those kids ended up disproportionately of kids of color ended up XYZ. 
And that's the point that I'm trying to get at. And so if it's not your data or not your info, it's not. But if it is, that's what I would like to see. Witchy. Um, I have two comments. My first one is <clears throat> based off of uh, Aaron's point, and I'm trying to remember what Aaron's point was, so I can <clears throat> so I can remember what my point was. Um, I'll get back to that one. My second point was um, based on this note um, about mandated reporting, um, and I know this is not exactly um what uh, which all we're referring to but i do want to sort of like remind us of that duality of like reporting of like reporting it, it can be god to, to know more information and also on the other hand it it increases labor cost right and adds bureaucracy just so just sort of like reminding ourselves of like when we add a report it doesn't mean that another type of reporting is taken out um and also that you know resources are going to be spent by that organization or department um trying to trying to take care of that reporting so just really thinking uh just being cognizant of that Aaron, do you remember what your point was yeah sure i was just saying that um once we identify um some of these high impact you know critical decision making points the another question will be how you know, what our recommendations are that could affect mm, that's right. those decisions in a positive way. And because it's complicated in terms of who has the authority to make the decision can sometimes affect then who also has the authority to say, you know, let, we're going to put these parameters around how you make decisions. Right. Um, thank you for reminding me of that. Uh, I guess my question, it's more of a question than a comment. Um, and I guess maybe more to Aton than the whole group, but uh, we are technically a legislative advisory group. So we're advising the legislature, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if we have recommendations that not necessarily the legislature can take up, but maybe different agencies or different, um, different branches uh could we still make those recommendations um and have them be noted to those parties i don't see why not okay thank you i don't see why not it's going a little beyond but you know i like going beyond well well it's also you know to the point that i think we're all making that you know it, things don't happen in silos no right? they don't so it's important that when we look at things and we note that there are things maybe outside of our outside of our scope that they are noted to whose scope that does belong to and you know, and sort of given context from our perspective. Absolutely. I mean, that was Susanna's point when she was going and talking about we have to talk about housing, right. we have to talk about all these other parameters. Um, right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Um, I wanted to just point pull in here that one of the reasons that we, and I remember this, that we didn't go before, there were two reasons, that we didn't go before the criminal justice encounter in those, in the uh, sketching, I would say, of the high impact, high discretion moments. Um, the one reason was it's about the criminal justice system. So, I mean, that's our purview. And we were being very strict then. We don't have to be, but we were. The second point was we were really having a hard time figuring out how to get the information, for instance, about mandated reporters, about anything that would happen that would be high impact, high discretion that happens in schools. We weren't sure how to get that. Part of that being that there's a confidentiality issue. Um, and we looked at that moment and quite honestly, and I don't say this to punish us, um, we it was so complicated and so twisted that it was actually, I would say, a relief to, in some ways that we were, our purview is the criminal justice system, and we just stayed there. 
because we could, and we also were just overwhelmed by, I mean, you know, all of you who are here, what we went through to get that table done that exists now. I mean, it the data, it was so imperfect. It still is very imperfect. It's incomplete. Um, some data just doesn't, just isn't collected. It's nowhere to be found. Um, and so when we got to talking about things like schools, we kind of went right or wrong. I'm not putting a value judgment on this. I'm simply acting as a historian at the moment that we went at that moment and went, let's start here. Let's start here. Mark. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think we can say that we're further along than we've ever been. And, um, you know, I think we can stop punching ourselves in the heads and, uh, and, and you know, talking about all this regret. Stop it. Um, so I, I think the other thing is, is the, um, it's, it's also the juvenile justice system. Yep. And the juvenile justice system is, is very messy. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's what Tyler is talking about. You know, whether it's like here where I'm at, it could be Burlington School District. They're, they're on a DEI call right now uh, in the other room. And, um, or it could lead all the way to the doorstep if it's a truancy thing. And maybe even involve a parent for that matter. Um, in terms of incarcerating a parent. And yes, it has happened. I've seen it. Uh, it could be uh, DCF, whether or not the child moves over to the justice system, whether there's a removal, whether there's a TPR, whether there's an adoption, there's all kinds of stuff that can go in different directions. The community justice center comes into play, the state's attorney's office, the police can refer to the child directly into the community justice center with high level, high impact discretion, law enforcement, corrections, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, and I just said that to say this is that, um, you know, it's complicated. The juvenile justice system is much, it's not linear. The criminal justice system is not linear. The juvenile justice system is less linear, um, quite a bit less linear. Um, but I, I can't help but to go back to what Susanna was saying is it's just, you know, this is this is a systems game that we're talking about, whether it's, um, you know, as we're in maybe later on, if there's time for a public comment, I can tell you more about some of the stuff that we're doing in this area with support and assistance to at risk um, and uh, justice impact at youth and young adults, just things that we're talking about doing, because there's more than one way to skin a cat uh, if you're into cats, um, you know, in terms of just um, how to um, how to address how to mitigate how to how to mitigate this the impact of the systemic racism that we're seeing across these systems and we got to get outside of the governmental hat that we're wearing with policy right. and thinking about oh well we train people and there's all kinds of ways you know you got inside and outside there's folks that we're doing stuff out here too so I can tell you more about that but you know the movers and shakers you know whether it's DCF Howard VDH MHD correction state's attorney's office the list goes on a lot of moving parts uh judiciary CJC United Way um there's a lot of folks that we're you know kind of navigating um to um to address some of these uh outcomes to include the school district to include um you know like um capstone or CVOEO or CHT or Community Health Centers of Burlington, and you know, again, the list goes on and on because there's a lot of there's a lot of resources that are out there that need to be navigated, and I think a lot of folks that are engaged that are either at risk or just as impacted youth or young adults. Part of the challenge that they have is is they just don't know how to navigate these systems. Right. Uh, I'll leave it there, and if there's time to talk later, I can come back and talk more about right. that. Thank you, Mark. Witchy. I have, I have two things. Um, the first one is just sort of lighten the mood, a little light humor here. Mark said, um, ways to skin the cat if you're into cats. Just want to say if you're into cats, you probably don't want to hear about skinning cats. So I just thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> um, the, the second thing that I wanted to, I wanted to say, um, just to sort of for me, you know, as with a background in in technology engineering, I feel like whenever I've had something messy, I kind of go 
back to start and I'm going to be a little naive. So if y'all permit me to be just a little naive, um, you know, if it wasn't messy, if it was a simple process, what do we want that to, what would we want that to look like? Right? Like, are, are we saying that we, we, we do want the juvenile system, right? Uh, do we do we want the incarceration? I, I feel like I feel like I'm I'm maybe skipping ahead a little bit, but I guess my my point is that when I think that there's something messy and there's a messy concept, I I kind of almost want to step back and away from it and just think sort of being an ideal world of like what would we want it to look like? What is the simplistic version of what it is that we envision? and then start applying the layers that exist. And I think we might find um, things that we don't need to look at or things that we would want to look at more into or even, you know, redundancies in the system or or places where things are just missing. So I just want to kind of like encourage us that it, it, when we get to the place that we're feeling like things are messy, things are too complicated to sort of grab, um, to sort of just do sort of like a re like reinitialization kind of um process so just want to throw that out there as something to to think about as we try to wrap our brains around a system that's been around for hundreds of years and hundreds of years complicated policies and biases have seeped in okay i want to make i it's 25 past seven tyler the, the point of this was initially to give you enough to work on i about probably 20 minutes ago was hoping that you had enough. And now I'm kind of hoping that you don't want to kill yourself. Um, I, I've just decided I'm never coming back, Aton. <laughs> no, not at all. No, this is really, really good conversation. I, and, and I appreciate it deeply. Um, and I think the starting point, the first handful of notes I took are based on this. There's a lot to. I think this conversation opened up tremendously um, because we are considering DCF in entirety as an agency. And DCF, really, I, 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 I see it as there's kind of two sides of the shop. One of those sides has to do with juvenile justice, and one of them has to do with child welfare. And which isn't to say that child welfare is the wrong place to be setting our eyes, but it opens up lots and lots of new questions, entirely different discretionary points, and there's, it's in juvenile justice, it's, it's a little bit easier to say, well, we can agree on a common truth here is that we want to see less youth involved in juvenile justice. Like we can say, we want to see less adults in the criminal justice system. That's a uniform, which isn't to say that Derek doesn't provide incredible work to adults going through the criminal justice system in terms of rehabilitating and supporting their 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 many diverse needs but generally speaking we could we can say less of that with dcf it gets complicated because it's a it's this huge range between preventative services to families reaching out for support services um to protective elements to it so it's 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 not as concrete as saying if somebody is involved with DCF that that is in and of itself an outcome to step back from necessarily. It doesn't mean that there isn't disparity we should be addressing. Like who, where are we seeing? To Mark's good point, where are we seeing more terminating parental rights and so on and for, so forth? I, I generally speaking, I can assume a termination of parental rights is something we want to see less of in our state. Although typically when there's a termination of parental rights, it's because there is um, egregious concern that should that not happen, that somebody will die. So it's it it there's a different flavor and a nuance to some of those conversations. And so as we unpack that stuff as a group, um, depending on how far we want to go down there, it it really opens this conversation up. And I don't want to shy away from any of those conversations. I just want to paint a realistic picture of what that looks like. Then for the next meeting, I'd like some uh, direction as to what where this particular topic, now, I'm not saying this right. 
what regarding this should go on the agenda for the next meeting? I would just suggest that Rebecca's good point before um, in terms of dusting off that discretionary point table that was defined, the Got charts it. where the data is and stuff like that. I think there's a good starting point in there. I think certainly there's plenty there's plenty of fertile ground to talk about juvenile justice because we've avoided juvenile justice a little bit because juvenile justice, we have confidentiality questions. I think if nothing else, that Tiffany is among us now. She's one of us. Oh, I don't know if she's still here. Um, but the Tiffany's here. That's going to be really, really relevant to, I mean, she's representing the agency that's going to be pulling together data from multiple places, and hopefully we can neutralize some of the confidentiality challenges. Okay. Rebecca? My suggestion is the Juvenile Justice Subcommittee meet before next month and using this, you know, the notes and our memories of what came out of the discussion to organize the fine points and see if we can sort of put a, put an outline and suggestions to bring back to the to the group. Does that work? And Tyler, is that I, I volunteered to join you uh, the last one? I think we had some others. I'm hoping we have others. But I would love it if you joined us, Rebecca. Okay, I'm in. And I'm hoping, Rebecca, that you will find this in your papers. <laughs> That <laughs> I'm so glad you don't throw anything out. Or anyone else, Sheila, Jess, Susanna. <laughs> right. Karen. I just have a quick question if Matthew Bernstein is still here about what is the like the mission or the charge of the Office of the Child, Youth, and Family Advocate? Um do they have a charge to be thinking about disparities in the child welfare system? I wouldn't want to take up somebody else's work. If someone else is doing it, then um, it might not need to be a focus of ours. So just curious about that. He's not on anymore. Okay, I'll ask him. <laughs> All right. Um, if we can sort of close this off and get on to the other issues that we have on the agenda. Um, there, the one thing I do want to close this with, though, is a reminder, and the person who I remember putting this forth over and over again, as well as Sheila, is Jess Brown, about we don't necessarily need the data to know that something's not working here. And that has been a theme that we've had running along for the past few years. Um, but I, all, I, you know, again, we were charged by the legislature to put together eventually the DRJS, which is about data. That's what the D stands for. So we very understandably got that to that point. But I do not want us to forget that really, really critical notion that we don't need the data to know there's a problem. That's all. All right. Uh, next was uh, the update. Aaron, are you right? Update on the bills, the very few bills with which we've been involved, um, frankly, this uh, this uh, session. Can I give it over to you, Erin, to sort of fill us in on that? Sure. And I'll try to keep it brief in case folks have questions or if they want to bring up other bills, maybe that they are interested in talking about or worked on. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about S4 and S14 because those are the only two bills that the RDAP was asked to weigh in on by the legislature. Um, so the first one that we were asked to testify about was S14, which is an act relating to a report on criminal justice related and investments and trends. And Aton did testify on that bill when it was in Senate Judiciary. At that point, it was a much more specific and, and smaller bill than what it ended up being now. Um, 
it used to be called something like an act relating to justice reinvestment reporting. And it was really just supposed to be about um, the entities that get justice reinvestment grant funds to report about essentially what are they doing with the funds that they get and the effects that they think those funds are having. It was pretty simple. Um, justice reinvestment funds are supposed to come from DOC's bed savings. So in other words, um, when DOC saves money by not sending folks to out-of-state private prison, um, DOC is supposed to take those savings that they would otherwise have spent on that and provide, use that money for justice reinvestment initiatives per the justice reinvestment one and justice reinvestment two reports that um, the council for state governments did with various government stakeholders and the community-based organizations that get some of that money include community justice centers who are doing restorative justice work um, the network against sexual and domestic violence and some others and they were just supposed to re basically report about what they're using the money for it turned into a much um, into, into a bill about a much bigger look at the entire criminal legal system. Um, and the, it's basically a two part bill. Um, the first part is what the Senate passed out. And it's basically Christopher Loris's homework bill, which is the uh, CRG crime research group has to take a really big look at um, basically the entirety of the system, working with other stakeholders and reporting to many, many stakeholders about trends in the criminal justice system and essentially like, how are we spending our money and is it working? Should we be doing something differently? And there's two reports um, due before the bill would sunset. One is November 15th, 2024, and the next one is three years later. Um, and that, that second one is supposed to reference the first report and kind of like, okay, what are we doing differently? How are we making improvements based on this first report? Um, it's really quite, uh, uh, a, it's, a, it's going to take a really big broad look at the criminal justice system. Um, lots of data collection going on and, and analysis and reporting. That's what passed out of the Senate. And then um, on the House side, things kind of shifted because in part, there were some people that were some entities that were very frustrated with the process around how it is decided who gets the money, the justice reinvestment money, the bed savings. And there were lots of concerns with how that process worked this past year. And that led to these wide ranging discussions around um, well, maybe we need some kind of a special fund that will support community organizations. Maybe there, need, there then needs to be an advisory council that is directing the legislature about how to um, divvy up the special fund. That whole thing was scrapped. Now where it stands is DOC is just setting aside $900,000, which was an estimate of bed savings. And there's all these, there is an advisory council with many stakeholders who are supposed to be recommending to the legislature by September 15th, I think, um, about how this $900,000 is spent. Um, that S14 has passed the Senate, not, no, passed the Senate, passed the House, but the Senate hasn't passed the amendments that happened in the House. And I don't know if it will do that before Friday when the legislature wants to wrap up. Um, there's a conference committee right now to see if lawmakers from Senate Judiciary and House Judiciary can agree on some kind of um, consensus bill. If they can, then that will go to the floor and that could be voted out, we'll see. Okay. Um, any questions about S14? Erin, if I'm not mistaken that uh, 900,000 is not expected to be a perennial annual amount for reinvestment, but is just the most recently 
calculated amount from FY22, I think, right? So, so that, that the monetization of our out-of-state bed savings is a variable amount from year to year too. I think that's right. That's my understanding too, Derek. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah. I would say therein lies the rub for a lot of <laughs> how do you, community. How, yeah, how do you build a, a, a service infrastructure on the vagaries of one-time funding that may or may not be available and may or may not be uh, authorized on a subsequent year for that purpose, yeah. Right, and there were a lot of conversations too about why is it just these government agencies, primarily executive branch agencies deciding who gets the money and for what purposes. And so that led to some interesting conversations about maybe there needs to be an independent agency, like an Office of Justice Programs or something of that nature. But that did, that, that did not come to any kind of fruition or anything close to it. But it, this is a bill that has led to a lot of interesting conversations and hopefully will, at the very least, lead to some good... Um, you know, data analysis and collection and conversations around our spending priorities on the criminal legal system and how to do better with that. Um, S4, you're, I think you should all be familiar with S4 because that is the bill that we discussed last month that led to really important conversations with this group about how um, nobody had asked RDAP to weigh in on S4 um, which is titled, well, it's the juveniles, I call it the kids, drugs and guns bill, but it's not called <laughs> that. It's an act relating to reducing crimes of violence associated with juveniles and dangerous weapons. And you'll recall that Marshall Paul from the Defender General's office came and presented to us some um, concerns that he had observed arising in the Senate that um, regarded racial disparities for youth of color that could flow from this bill if enacted. Um, and we were concerned about that, but also just the very fact that we were not asked to weigh in despite our statutory charge to be advising the legislature about racial, racial disparities. Um, and so then also, as I think you all know, um, some of us did provide testimony once the bill got to the House side. Aton yes. provided incredible, oh. sorry, I was just pausing as I was thinking back on your testimony and trying to think of the adjective for it. It was incredible. It was really compelling, really persuasive, um, and it changed the tide on S4 um, on the House side. And so um, from that point on, there's just been a lot of negotiations between the House and the Senate Judiciary Committees um, about what was going to remain in S4, what wasn't, what you know, language changes, what was going to be modified. Um, the you know, the chief concern that Marshall Paul raised about S4, and it is like this multi-part bill, but Marshall was raising the concern about adding a whole bunch of crimes to the Big 12 that would allow, meaning that if, if, a, if a youth is charged with a big 12, then they can be um, adjudicated in adult court. Um, S4 no longer adds any offenses to the big 12, um, except for all of the big 12 offenses that currently exist. Also um, adding to that is an attempt to commit any of those big 12s. Um, but that, according to Marshall Paul's testimony in the House, would not actually really change the way those cases are handled now. So as it stands in S4, there are no new crimes added to the Big 12. There is a Sentencing Commission study committee that will be charged this summer and fall with providing recommendations about whether a whole huge list of offenses should be added to the Big 12. Um, but as it stands now, those would not be added upon the passage of S4. A whole bunch of other changes happened. At the two committees have not agreed on them. This bill has not passed the House and the Senate. We'll see what happens. I would, if anyone else wants to add anything to that, it, help me out, I'd appreciate it. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, congratulations, RDAP, specifically. Like I, uh, we, the Defender General's Office, has been tracking this from the Senate side of S four introduction. Uh, when when we became very alarmed at at sort of the summary disregard that we were getting uh, reception, Senate Judiciary, we came to you and specifically, as, as Anne said, you heard from our juvenile defender, deputy defender last month on the specific disparities. And as Aaron referenced, but I cannot stress enough having was in the room in House Judiciary, but for RDAP's not just requests to come and testify, pushing our way in to make it clear we should have been invited at Senate Judiciary, we're not, and we should be heard in the House Judiciary and the chair, Chair Lamond, being very gracious and, and inviting for sure, giving uh, this panel the space, but it wasn't just a ton. It was, it was panel members here who, who shared specific comments that Aton could share, but it was the letter writing campaign that I know we got from key community members that heard about this, that was instrumental. Uh, and, and Susanna Davis to your testimony before House Judiciary on the racial uh, disparate impact of adding to, we keep calling it the big 12, it's the, it's the big 12 felony offenses list that makes it so that a youth uh, is presumptively charged one of these big 12 offenses goes right to the criminal justice system. But this panel helped to stop was adding to it three, uh, at least three more offenses where we knew there were already racially disparate uh, numbers. So I just, I, I, I wanna say, A, we should spend a moment. We, we, had, we had a tremendous impact last month. And I know we haven't, it hasn't been voted on, I believe, Aaron, out of house yet, S4. So we, we don't know where that's gone, but where it stands, um, House Judiciary really pushed back against the Senate version. Um, and that was because of the testimony and, and letters. So, Thank you, uh, everyone, for the last minute scramble, but very tangible results. We'll see if it, what happens, but. Yeah, I, I really want, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think it passed the House and now the Senate has to consider the amendments. So it's, it's really close, but the question is, of course, what is the Senate going to think of this? Because they are the ones that did not invite RDAP um, or I don't believe Susana didn't get letters from the NAACP, didn't hear from us. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. But they did in the end get letters from the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, from Mark Hughes's group, and from both chapters of the NAACP. It was quite a brilliant letter. And um, I know that that was profoundly impactful. So stuff happened. Jennifer. I think I'm exactly following this as well on the record that's I just, I want to be, I mean, I have a lot of things. I hate to be You sound like you're in a tunnel. No, I'm going to be talking more. Is that better? I don't think so. That's Try weird. Again. Oh, there, that. Um, well, not um, now. It, there was a moment. I was writing this now. Oh, I really wanted to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I can't, I don't know why this is happening. Oh boy. Um, Sorry. All right. Uh, Sorry. Anyone else questions or comments on this? I no. just want to. I just want to add, and I, I know I expressed to you personally, Aton. Uh, I appreciated your testimony too. I thought you were magnificent. I really um, thought you represented this group really well. 
um, very articulately um, and held a nice line of expressing the outrage um, that that I was hearing in this group last month, but also um, um, doing it with a sense of decorum and you were well well received and I, I felt a really palpable um, kind of impact from folks in the room. So I thought you did a really nice job in there. And uh, again, kudos to the panel um, for providing all the feedback that was provided. Yeah, uh, I did want to add, I, I thought in the latest version I saw, um, this is kind of a minor detail, but that the attempteds were, were, were retained. Uh, when Marshall came and talked, he was comfortable with it. Um, but there was two Big 12 offenses, um, not attempteds, uh, the um, aggravateds were were included with it so if it's uh you know if there's a uh, um a I can't, I can't remember what what the two were but adding an aggravated to the offense type essentially means that um you know right. there was a there's a firearm involved there was a bodily injury so on and so forth it's a more kind of severe version of the same charge so i don't think anybody had any problem with it i think there was an assumption murder yeah 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 so aggravated murder as opposed to just murder right um so i don't think anything anybody pushed back on those elements and sexual assault yep yeah that's right those were the two new additions but they're really not addition they're not substantively different they're they're legally different um okay. and i think there is a version where they are wrestling with the question it's not added to the big 12 but wrestling with the question of um carrying a firearm in the commission of an assault but it is not included in there it would be something to be considered by the um you know this case if it was a juvenile it would go directly to family court but it would be um uh, at that family court setting, they would make a determination whether or not should immediately move into criminal court. So if this is an, a felony offense that involved a firearm, that that question would be asked in the family court. So again, it would not be originating in the criminal court as, as it would have if it was a big 12. Right. There, I th the compromise was for... Um... 16 to 18 year olds for there to be an expedited process for some of the crimes that could now under current law put them from family co court into adult court but just to expedite that process for some offenses and I, this was a compromise from the house to the judiciary to say we heard what your concerns are here's a process that we could do now without adding to the big 12 right away, we'll let the sentencing commission deliberate about the big 12. Okay. Can I try one more time? We can hear you. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll be really quick. One piece I thought that this group would like to know um, has been added to the charge of the sentencing commission is to explore whether or not big, the, the, whether or not burgl burglary into an occupied dwelling should remain as a big 12. Wow. Um, because certainly there are times when courts have basically taken a really expansive view of that. So it could not, it might not even be a house. It might be a barn that's on the property. It might be a shed. So at the time when this was put in, to my understanding, it was contemplating that somebody would actually be in that dwelling. So now not only does somebody not even have to be in it, but it can be an outer dwelling. So they want the sentencing commission to see if that should remain as part of the big 12. Right. Great. And I was trying to compliment you, Aton. I thought you did an amazing job. You certainly had had everybody riveted. And, and I really think, I don't think, I think for me, what they learned is that they didn't think about it. And I think that the Senate didn't think about it, but I think the House didn't either. And I believe yeah. that if we had gotten the, the attention of Senate Judiciary, and I'm glad Marshall did bring this to the group, that I really believe that Senator Sears would have heard this. Um, juvenile issues, if you know Senator Sears, those are really near and dear to his heart. So I think the learning for you all for, as RDAP is that start knocking on their doors and they'll let you in and they'll listen. But, you know, I think both, both bodies really realize like, whoa, we totally dropped the ball. And I have been, you, I would thank you for bringing that up, Jennifer, because I, I have been starting to talk with various members of the legend, particularly at this point, Nader Hashim, who's vice chair of Senate judiciary 
And also, of course, with um, Representative Lalonde, who is chair of House Judiciary, about needing to construct a pipeline so that this panel is kept aware of racial justice or bills that concern racial justice. Um, we men I mentioned um, the equity impact tool that the Office of Racial Equity and Susanna um, have put together and have sort of said, you know, I don't know why you are and aren't using it. There are a lot of the rest of us who are, and you might want to think about that. Um, so that conversation has started. I'm pursuing it just so you know, so that this situation would just stop, um, you know, because they were kind of like, uh, oh, my God, you know, you should. I mean, it's on the agenda. I said, yes, and everyone has a job. You do, too, and your job is the legislature. So let me add something to your job, <laughs> which wasn't the happiest thing, but they heard it. They heard it. They heard, you know, they understood that there's there's a problem. And so we're work, trying to work on what that would look like, just, you know, a utilitarian plan. So there it is. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to ju just shelve that last part of the agenda. Um, I just, what I want to just put out here and I can sum it up very briefly is I would like the subcommittees to start thinking about drafting paragraphs. Okay. Just that start drafting paragraphs because we really do have to start thinking about a written report so i just want to put that out there generally um to everyone we can talk about it in more detail next month but i would just like to ask that that be um really kept in your mind at this point witchy yeah, I just wanted to note that um, at the Community Safety Review Subcommittee, we we are hoping to provide um, more than one paragraph <laughs> on on our stuff. Um, and uh, you know, if you if you have a specific um type of outline you would want us to write no. that with, or great. All right, no, well, just do it. We'll okay, worry maybe. about that later. All right, maybe add some some pictures, some flowers on the frame. Uh, if you're so moved <laughs> by God, do All what right. makes you feel good. Yeah. Um, I this has been a very interesting. Uh, Mark, go ahead before we stop. Thanks, Aton. <clears throat> I'd like permission to get on your agenda for next uh, next month to talk about uh, credible messengers and uh, just to basically support and, and supporting and assisting at risk and justice impact of youth and young adults. Uh, and I can talk about, you know, what we're doing on that and, and where we are on it. And I think- Would love it. This place is the about the best place. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to second what folks were saying about your testimony. I, I hadn't heard it, but I heard a lot about it. Uh, oh, so uh, thanks thank for that you. as well. Thank you. Um, and thank you for your letter. So um, actually, I was, you know, I was in D.C. I was I was traveling and, and I, I think Tabitha did mostly everything. Um, I, I'm not I don't think I really did hardly anything except for just reviewed it. But um, it was it was a good, you know, collaboration exercise. Yeah. Yeah. People came together and I was really it was lovely, actually. So, uh, so. I'll, I'll, um, I'll plan on coming back next month. Yes. And I'll still and want to invite the um this the RDAP to um to Burlington um and I know at some point or another if if you guys are we're going to start doing more uh community engagement and sure. trying to get out of the community I'm sure um I don't want to speak too quickly for Sheila but I'm sure Sheila would probably be willing to host down at the the uh at the um Root Social Justice Center as well that would be a, a good opportunity and Sheila by the way it is good to see you um, I'm thinking she, Sheila and, and Rebecca, I'm just giving y'all special shout outs. You know why. 
Okay, so Mark, you and I will be in touch then. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, the next meeting is the 13th of June. Um, and I'm looking forward to, I don't know, all sorts of, in <laughs> Tyler, be in touch um, about what you would like to do going forward as well. Um, that would be helpful. Um, and I think that's it for tonight. Thank you all for a riveting conversation, actually. Um, and this is the moment where I say I would entertain a motion. You know about what. I'll move to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Is anyone? I will, I will second that move. Grand. All in favor, gesticulate in some violent way. Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstaining? Motion is carried. Have a lovely month. See you all in June. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, everybody.